Well, as you've seen there, Muda Yusuf joins us this morning. He is the head man at CPPE. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's uh, an indication this morning on the front pages of the paper. Some of the papers are talking about power supply. Let's begin from there. Uh, the, the Daily Trust actually was very, very explicit that millers, barbers, literally small businesses, they are crying, you know, about the effect of massive blackout in the north, saying that power outage is grounding their businesses and um, that a state of emergency should be declared in, in, the, in the electricity sector. At the end of the day, it's the effect that that is having on the economy that is germane. What's your take on that to begin with? Well, my take is that we need to prioritize our... Uh government expenditure on energy because energy is very very critical for economic development there is no economy that can progress without sufficient support in terms of energy whether you are talking about uh, electricity or you are talking about uh, you know renewable energy or you are even talking about fuel so government government presence in that space is extremely very very important mm. Now, what we have seen uh, in the electricity sector has been issues of, you know, maybe over-centralization, because yeah. a whole lot of this has to do with the, the grid, you know, vandalization of the grid and all of that. Something happens in Jeba, it affects the whole country. Something happens in Oshobo, it affects the whole country. So that over-centralization for a country of our size is something that we need to look at. And I think that even the current reform process around the power sector, is looking at all of that. But we need to we need to fast track mm -hmm. all that processes. Because these are more critical things, you but, know. But, but isn't that something mm -hmm. more that you know even the subnationals or states in particular should be championing, given that now they have a legal provision to be able to generate electricity, transmit as they want and all that. Well they, they should be doing that. Mm -hmm. But again it depends on what capacity they have. Because for me I think the capacity some... they have or capacity they need. No, capacity they have. Okay. Both, both, both the capacity they have and the capacity <laughs> they need. When I say capacity they have, I mean they have, it's about financial resources. Because some of these things require some heavy lifting. You know, and about capacity that they need, they also need capacity to effectively put the institutional structures in place mm. to be able to manage the space and regulate it. Not many of them have that, that, that capacity. Mm. So there are, there are issues around you know, uh, managerial capacity, institutional capacity, and financial capacity. But in the meantime, I think the federal government needs to continue to play the lead role as far as some of these major reforms are concerned, mm. as far as some of uh, the policies that are needed to drive the reforms. Mm. We have been talking about mini grids, we have been talking about uh, renewable energy. I mean, imagine if the barbers and all these things that you, you, you talked about have access to solar or some of this other renewable energy is, at a cheaper cost. Is that to say that the, all of the initiatives of the government, be it federal or state, is not yielding results? We understand, of course, you are not unaware of the Rural Electrification Agency and all of the initiatives that have been you know, going on in that space for quite a while. Is it well, not... well, well, a lot has been happening, okay. but again, we are dealing with a major gap. Mm a major deficit in this space. Mm. So what has been happening is not, it's not making that material impact mm. on the deficit we have in the, in the power supply space. It means then, just as you said, mm. maybe because we haven't really had the difficult conversation of who and who should be involved in the, in the energy sector, because if the states are playing as significantly as the federal government is playing, being that it's now a constitutional thing that for them, maybe it will be easier. It will be easier, but it will, it will take them some time. Okay. No, this, 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 at, at least let's see some movement. They, they have to do some be hopeful. Yes. Yeah. And more importantly, is for government to also support this process with the appropriate fiscal policy measures. Mm. You know, we should not have a situation where the cost of installing solar system inverters the battery will be costing so much. Because if these things were cheaper, you know, many people even walk away from this, this, uh, this national grid thing. 
Don't buy your solar, get your batteries, and you move on with your life. You know, so, but we need the right kind of fiscal policy in terms of the import duty that you have to pay on solar panels, on inverters, on batteries, possibly even a subsidy. That is what happens in some other parts of the world that are, you know, pushing aggressively on this energy transition. They subsidize things that have to do with renewables so that more people will be able to transit on their own. Mm. Well, you know, well, there's okay. also the issue of financing. Well, I saw one or two banks are trying to provide financing to support the transition, you know, at, uh, at micro level, you know, supporting solar systems and so on. Mm. Let us see more of that. So that even at our micro level, people can take decisions mm. that, will, that will make their lives, you know, much, much better and easier. How do all of these play in the position of the, CB, of the IMF saying that uh, uh, Nigeria's uh, uh, growth ha has, uh, is now a little slower since IMF slashes Nigeria's growth prospects over low oil production, severe flooding and, flooding and others? Is this energy security or a lack of it included in the others? Well, it is possible, but the energy issue is not, it's not something that is new. Mm. You know, it's almost what you can regard as a constant mm. in an equation. So I think what, what, what the IMF is saying for me, uh, it's not something really significant. I'm saying that because our Q1 GDP growth was about 3%. It's about 3.98, I mean 2.98 or so, which is almost 3%. Our Q2 GDP was slightly over 3%, about 3.2. So if the IMF is now projecting that this will come down to 2.9 by the end of the year, not really material as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And in any case, we may even make up to 3%, given the fact that we made 3% in Q1, we made 3.2 in Q2, so we don't know what the Q3 will be because of some of these challenges, but really not in material. Mm. You know, what, what, is, what is more, more important for us now? It's not even the issue of all this GDP growth and all of that. We are more bothered about the issue of cost of living, cost of doing business, you know, how prices can come down. Mm. These are the critical issues. Because when you talk to citizens about IMF projection and all of that, for many people, it's just something that's purely academic. Just want to get by and, the day. Yes, and, and so what? GDP is going to move to 3%, 4%, and so what? Mm. You know? But, so the critical issues is what we should be bothered about. So when IMF speaks sometimes, you wonder whether well, you're really know, addressing the core issues you know, that we are dealing with. I mean, look at our performance in Human Development Index. Look at our performance in manufacturing capacity utilization. Look at the poverty situation. Look at the very depressing data that is coming from the world. But aren't these other all you know, part of a whole? No, no, no. You see, the focus of IMF most of the time, IMF has the social content in their, in their perspective is very, very minimal. They're always looking at some of these data, abstract data, GDP, and all of that. You know, they don't, they don't address so much issues that, that have serious, you know, bearing on businesses, on SMEs, and more importantly, on the welfare of the people. But if you, know, you look we, at we need to be having more conversation. Hmm. But if you look at around that, yeah. But if you look at the issue that that IMF raised, one of the issues, one of the consequences, or rather, one of the causes of that projection is low oil production. And you would also listen to the Minister of uh, Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy also saying that if we improve oil production, we will boost FX inflows. And how significant is that for you? That is not news. I mean, that is. That is, but how do that, you see, that, 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 that is what we all know. How is it? How sh and do you, uh, are you optimistic about that? That's the real question. Well, well, I, I'm, I'm optimistic because I know that the government has been doing a lot trying to tackle the challenges that has been impeding oil output. You know, issues of oil theft. I'm also aware that the government has been doing a lot to drive investment, especially in gas. You know, because we have even bigger endowments in gas than in crude oil. 
you know, a lot of incentives, and I see that a lot of investors are showing a lot more interest in investing in gas. I think that is something that is significant. So if we're able to make you know, significant progress along those fronts, of course, it will have a significant impact on the entire macroeconomic environment. Mm. Because no matter what we say, oil is still the bigger issue as far as FX is concerned today. Mm. If you are talking about boosting our, our foreign exchange inflows, it has to start with oil. Mm. Because that is perhaps the low-hanging fruit for us if you can remove some of these impediments and all of that. So if you are able to make progress, I mean, luckily oil price is very high now, you know, so it's a big advantage for many oil oil producing countries. But then there, there are those who are still in that space, maybe mm. just one of the segments of oil production mm. is the uh, petrol. Recently there is news fil fl filtering around that our petrol consumption has cut come down because of the increase in the prices. Um, what do you make of that? There are those who are saying that as a result of the increase in prices, um, bunkering has reduced, um, illegal exportation of our of petroleum products have reduced in the country. Do you agree with them? Is there validity in that? But as a third point, many people have also packed their cars. <laughs> <laughs> so you to buy full tank or half tank and now buy a quarter of a tank. Some, some of them, some people have also said that look, when they go abroad anyway, they don't even drive their cars; ah, they go in public transport uh -huh. and all of that. But you what, know, is it, is so it is all it, valid? No, it's, it's valid. But what I'm saying is that we need to expand the variables. Okay. Yes, the smuggling will reduce because the incentive to smuggle. Has, has, has practically been eliminated. But the, is, it, is it actually significant on the, the number of liters that we consume in the country? Does it, does, does it help to produce real figures? Of course it helps. You see a clearer figure, you know, when you have this kind of thing. But again, we need to disaggregate the drivers of these figures. There are the, there are the fact that even domestic consumption has dropped significantly. I mean, you can see that, I mean, in many places where you used to have a lot of traffic, there is, there, is, there is no so much traffic anymore. You drive into the filling station now, you spend 10,000, maybe you get uh, maybe 10 liters or, or even less. So you have to, you have to plan your, your journeys. You have to determine where to go and where not to go. So there is a lot of economics now around, you know, the use of fuel. People are now much more conscious, they are now much more economical, you know, so that is also a major factor. Mm. So there is a factor of the fact that even in economics, you see, once prices go up, the demand drops. This is also reflected in, 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 in the demand for fuel. So we are seeing a much, a much, a much more realistic figure, but again, this is not also such a big uh, positive that many people cannot put their cars on the road. You know, uh, because, I mean, what alternatives do you have? It's a different thing if you are in an environment where you have very, you know, good public transportation system. That's why for the middle class. You can park your car and go. You are sure of the timing that the bus will come. You are sure that the bus will be decent. It's well maintained and all of that. There's a train that you can go, go to the uh, train station, take the train, no traffic. You are comfortable. So for me, that, is, that, is, that should be our aspiration. So that even voluntarily, people will decide to even, just as we have abroad, mm -hmm. but we don't have that yet. So that is why I feel that we need to make it slowly, you know, with this, with this deregulation of a thing. I'm talking of the PMS. Because it is still very central to mobility in the country. It's very central to connectivity within the country. It's very central to even the issue of inflation that you talk about. So we need, we need, we need to make it slowly. Uh, and, and I will also caution that we don't completely deregulate. Because we don't know what the trajectory will be. If, for instance, Israel now strikes uh, Iran and all of that, and crude oil price jumps up, are we going to still remain in the cost to say that we are completely deregulated? Then PMS price will now jump to what? 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5. Mm. 
How are we going to cope with that? So, so all these variables we need to take into account mm -hmm. in our policy process. It doesn't make any difference that we are technically producing in country. Well, well, it, it does, it does, it does make some difference, but again, it depends on how much of crude we're able to source locally. You know, there's a challenge, you know, uh, with how much can then NPC provide for the domestic refineries. It's also, uh, there's also an issue as to what exchange rates, because yes, it's a good thing what the government has done, that to be selling the crude to domestic refineries in Naira, but at what exchange rate? You know, if it is going to be at the prevailing exchange rate, that may still, you know, have implications for the price. But, but of course, there's a whole lot of advantage uh, in the fact that we are producing domestically and as much as possible, mm. we should have a policy process to encourage that domestic production. Now, talking about policies, very, very quickly, I want to talk mm. about cost of living, but very quickly, do you see a more harmonious monetary policy, fiscal policy arrangement now, which I've sp often spoken about before? Well, for me, I think it's work in progress. It's work in progress. The central bank governor has said that repeatedly. There is a need for harmonization and synergy. The minister of finance has also said that. And I think they are working collaboratively on that. But I think we need to do a lot more. Because uh, if you look at what is happening in the foreign exchange environment and all this problem of so-called liquidity in the system, because to the average man, to the average business people, they say there is no money, and yet they say there is excess liquidity. <laughs> so <laughs> people don't understand what is going on. And I think what we need to worry about is that the rate at which some of these government funds infiltrate the foreign exchange market, we should have a way, a framework to deal with it. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that each time we have this FAC allocation, we feel the impact in the forex market, particularly in the BDCs. And when you have a policy framework that is committed to convergence, so it under its pressure in the BDCs market, the CBI say, okay, the, the, the gap is widening, then they depreciate the official window. And all of us begin to suffer for it. Mm. But so when you have a situation where the factors driving demand for forex are not exactly rooted in genuine economic activities, we have to worry about that. These are some of the distortions that we are grappling with in the foreign exchange market. Do you see, because one of the issues that have also been raised around that, mm. you know, at least trying to control some of the issues that you have raised now, mm. is what the banks we hear were told, you know, that to, they up, upgrade to a particular um, software in the banking system so that government will be able to track some of these um, unscrupulous activities in the financial market. If that is true, do you see it as a, a, a good solution? No, in fairness to the CBN, the CBN has been trying a whole lot. Because it's, this is an unusual economy, you know? So you need, to, you, need to, you need to have that kind of very robust oversight. Because people are playing all manner of tricks. But the bigger issue is to me, of course, the elements of all these malpractices within the banking system, with some of this software may help to, to capture. But there are bigger issues outside the banks. Such as? I mean, I'm talking of the parallel market. Where people are just moving funds and all of that. You don't know what transactions is going on. People are moving, you know? There is, we don't have enough framework to monitor what is happening in the BDCs area, in, in the parallel market area. And what is happening there has significant implications. For, no, mon no, for monetary policy. Don't all of these monies go through the banks? No, 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 no. Not, not all of them. Okay, if, if, if there is a FAC allocation now from, uh, uh, from, go, from, from, from uh, maybe the, 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 to the government, yeah. and it flows from there to the BDCs, maybe in cash, because sometimes... I'm you, wondering, you, is, you it that, amazed. is it that they yeah. go to the FAC, the, that the FAC allocation is the big bags they, carry, they take away from the... I, think. I don't know how they do it, okay. because there's a lot of creativity. <laughs> All right. <around laughs> creativity. Yes. Interesting. Yes. But I have to ask you this question before we <laughs> sign off, uh, you know, Dr. Yusuf. What are the low-hanging fruits for the Nigerian? The cost of living is killing 
quite a number of people. And particularly at a time like this when the banks or some of the banks and all of them as they're going to go through the process are having this turbulent challenge, this transition, turbulent transition challenge. What are the low hanging fruits for the Nigerian? Well, the low hanging fruit for me will be around fiscal policy. We have had enough of monetary policy efforts. I'm talking of tightening and all of that. Even though the IMF is still, you know, urging the CBN to continue to tighten. But as far as I'm concerned, we have almost reached the limit of monetary policy tightening. So the focus should shift to the use of tax policies, to the use of fiscal policies, which is what all this presidential committee on fiscal policy and tax reform is all about. We should reduce our tariffs, we should reduce our cost of imports, we should reduce the cost of clearing cargo at the ports, you know, and we should reduce taxes. Because you cannot be tightening the news on all fronts. And how long do you think that all of this will take? It doesn't take time. Mm. I mean, it doesn't take time. If, if we get our bureaucracy to work well, mm. we have some policies that have been announced on fiscal policy, on food importation, on pharmaceutical products, some of them are yet to be implemented. So we need to work on the implementation machinery. I don't even want to you go know? into that uh, <laughs> proposal we hear is in the National <laughs> Assembly now for some tax laws. Yes. And don't even go there yet, <laughs> Dr. Buda Yusuf. Thank you so much for your time thank this morning. You, thank you, thank you. He is founder and CEO of Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise. Truly appreciate your time. Thank today. you, it's a pleasure. Markwe, Chamberlain. Oh, yeah, uh, a very interesting one, I tell you. But, yeah, this is where we draw the curtains uh, on the program today. We we'll have to thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain. So. Well, I'm going to end by reading the first lines from where we started. Apparently, you know, we have a few viewers following, and they knew the poem I was referring to about John Pepper Clark. Ibadan, Russian splash of rust and gold flung and scattered among seven hills like a broken china in the sun. That's from John <laughs> Pepper Clark, that famous poem. On Ibadan. Thank you so much for sending that in. And uh, I hope you have some Amala today. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Amal, where will you be? If only your husband was from Ibadan. Trust me, they will return the dowry today because they just love you more. <laughs> Amal, they do have a beautiful day. <laughs>